most biologists are not will, we're willing to admit some incompetence at not being able to find certain small mammals and certain obscure birds. But I mean, hey, we're not missing something nine feet tall. Please support this channel by subscribing and leaving comments. to ask questions. Dr. John Bindernagel from Portenay, BC. He will be speaking with a slide presentation, Progress on Field Research. Please welcome Dr. Bindernagel. Thank you. Thank you. This is only very formal. I'm glad to be here again. I'm really glad to have an opportunity to uh, talk about a few things with you. I'm getting to do a little bit more now. Uh, there are people here who don't know me, so maybe I'll just talk a little bit of background here to bring us up to date before we start on actual progress. I'm, I'm a person who did move to BC for the climate and the scenery. I actually, our family, we did move here for Sasquatch work. It, it was an attraction uh, for me for a long time. And uh, that was what brought us here in 1975. Uh, I want to make some, some acknowledgments. First to John Green, who was so encouraging at that time and who since then as well, and, and that even by then had created this incredible database that we're all talking about and that many of us have given us access to, and without which we really couldn't be anywhere near where we are today, I want to say that. I want to acknowledge many of the Hinden, especially for a line that I keep going back to, that something is making those damn tracks, and I want to find out what it is. But actually, I find that quite profound, because in the end, and I'll, I'll get to this later, these are the things that keep us going. Sightings, there's a lot of controversy about sightings, but as a wildlife biologist, I really appreciate tracks, and as I say, we keep going back to that one. Grover Krantz, who was probably the first academic to start taking heat, so to speak, and uh, publicly acknowledged his interest, his serious interest in this subject, and that was not easy, especially some years ago. I want to acknowledge Paul LeBlanc, who is with us today. He has done a similar thing here in, in Canada in, at the University of British Columbia. I can remember going to his office. He was then chairman uh, in the Department of Oceanography at, at UBC. And I was still pretty new in BC and in this area. And he was willing to speak publicly. I love his interest is in Cadborosaurus. And I always make a joke about that because we're in a, a society. And I always say, well, the Cadborosaurus people, you know, we don't know about this Cadborosaurus thing, but we got solid stuff for Sasquatch. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the Sasquatch stuff, but we got good stuff for Cadborosaurus. So it's, it's, it's humorous, but it's kind of fun, too. And we have the same problems, of course. And not, last but not least, I really want to acknowledge Jim Hugan, who is the first wildlife biologist to uh, come forward and, and publicly uh, work on it and talk about Sasquatch because we, we wildlife biologists are a pretty conservative group and uh, it's always interesting because I'm talking more and more with my colleagues about it and uh, most biologists are not, will, we're willing to admit some incompetence at not being able to find certain small mammals and certain obscure birds but I mean, hey, we're not missing something nine feet tall and weighing 700 pounds. But the problem is, we're not looking for it. We refuse to look for it. And, th and that, that someday is going, to, is going to hurt them very much. And what I see, I've just been to some uh, biologist meetings, professional biologist meetings, and a lot of biologists are being very friendly to me now. And I think biologists are, are kind of wanting to cover their, their all bases here because they're going to be very embarrassed at some point. And some of them are starting to realize that. I'll get to it later, but I was actually invited to, uh, to write an article for the professional newsletter of the Association of Professional Biologists of BC, and, and it just come out, so I'll mention that later. So that's, uh, that's basically my introduction. I think we can go right on with the slides, and uh, I want to talk about four aspects of my work here. Uh, last year at this time, I had said that I was trying to uh, work my way into full-time research on this, but be, being a privately funded person, that of course is a little bit idealistic. But it's coming, it's coming. I've managed to uh, 
put a little some funding aside and apply some of the consulting uh, funding towards this project. And as you can, you can see here, how, how coming up, how, how I'm spending some of it. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to, to carry on with that. Uh, I've got four aspects, actually, to the work I'm doing now. One is presentations, a lot of school groups. I'm also going to mountaineering clubs. I have an engagement with a fish and game club coming up. And th this is sort of my strategy of saying, well, I might not be out there beating the bushes as much as I'd like to be, but other people are out there. And if I can let them know that Sasquatch is a serious, is an option for what they're seeing, you know, I'll talk about this later too, you know, this problem that we have to write up everything as a hunting partner or a bear because that's all the choices for something. <laughs> so anyway, I'll talk about that. Uh, native culture and liaison, I'm working with several native people and I'm starting to give presentations to some bands because native people on the coast are wonderful to work with because they have Sasquatch in their culture as Bugwas uh, and Zunaqua and generally, I say generally, are quite open to it, the older people more than the younger ones. Trail monitoring equipment, I touched on that last year, uh, some camera equipment, which I spent a lot of time on. We're, we're getting somewhere with that. And uh, just uh, analyzing reports, uh, as, as we all do, and trying to make something out of it, as a wildlife biologist from an ecological point of view. So let's, let's move on here. This is my presentation stuff. And what I do, and you know, at the outset, I realize where many people are coming from. And this is where they're coming from. And so I say, I understand why you're skeptical about this subject. I mean, you know, and I, I did a school presentation a couple of weeks ago, and in the staff room later, the teacher said, uh, to the other, he said, it was great, John showed these photographs of tabloids, and since that's what most of the parents read in this in this class, these kids know exactly where it comes from. But I don't hear that. I don't know if he was serious or not, but that was kind of interesting. Anyway. And I, I mentioned, you know, what I used to refer to jokingly as the documentary film that we have. <laughs> uh, the but, you know, there, there's this little bits in I've only seen this once, I must look at it again. But my recollection is that there's always a little bit of reality brought into some of these things, which kind of interesting. And I wonder, one of my great bear, now I don't know why people laugh at this photograph of a bear. I guess maybe if it was taken in a shopping mall has something to do with it. But, but after I talk about uh, the appearance of Sasquatch with its prominent shoulders and its flat face, I, I, I like to switch over to bears standing up because so many people bring that in. So I do apologize, but this is in fact the only bear photograph I, I have of <laughs> And we have a traveling exhibit from Quebec which came to the shopping mall near us. But it's a great stuffed bear, I think. And it shows a lot of things. I mean, the tapering, the large head, the tapering shoulders, not at all prominent, and the very short hind legs. And this came up, I think it was, uh, maybe we were there in Harry Fehrenbach last year, talking about striding, you know, and this whole thing about striding and a pelvis up here. And, and not a pelvis down here where our knees are. So, you know, some of these differences I, I try to point out. And I also mentioned, you know, the profile thing, that we are talking about a flat-faced ape, whereas the bear has the prominent snout. So just a couple of the superficial things. And just to show you that I can't only get photographs of shopping mall bears, I can also get carved bears. <laughs> this is one up in, up in Port Hardy, which shows the same sort of thing. Uh, another standing up bear with uh, and the, and the same profile thing. So and, okay, now getting, getting a little more serious here, onto the subject of tracks. I, I have a good relationship with, with the bear biologist in the provincial government, the provincial fish and wildlife branch. And I, the bear biologists were really the first biologists I went to with my Sasquatch tracks, because I figured in our area, these are the guys that are in the habit, the right habitat. And there, there were two of them. They were both very nice, very non-committal. But when I went to them later saying, I'd like to get some really good grizzly bear track photographs for comparison, he was very cooperative. So we got this, this very nice photograph, and again, this is more for, for the public than anyone uh, who's been working on Sasquatch, but you know, the major differences between, I mean, certainly the, the, the forefoot of, of, of a bear, be it black bear or grizzly bear, is quite different from Sasquatch, very broad. Uh, the hind foot, and, yeah, I, will, I, I think I have to admit, you know, it, it is suggestive of, of a human footprint being, being cultivated. However, it, it's not as long, it's tapered to a point, and in soft substrates, claws do show with, with, with bears. So we have this from the Kinsquit Valley up the coast, and this uh, 
series of tracks from the Coupe de Matine. Uh, again, uh, really their tracks with the forefoot happening to be closest here. They use a uh, four-foot track width, the bear biologists do, to identify different bears. They get, they get variation here, and then hind feet. And of course, the other thing that I, that I point out is that in a Sasquatch trail, it's hind foot, hind foot, hind foot, it being bipedal, and on a bear trail, it's hind foot, forefoot being mixed up. So we probably try to kind of work through that, and just, because a lot of people haven't seen a lot of bear tracks, and partial tracks are difficult, so we try to work through that. I'm trying to get together some good photographs of Sasquatch tracks, and I realize how hard it is. John Green kindly loaned me this one from High Ampong, California, many years ago, which uh, I used uh, in the article here, and uh, it's actually, it's this whole business of, uh, well, you, you, you know the difference is we're going to talk so much about tracks today, I'm not going to dwell on it here. And, and I always bring in, I myself, uh, that's, that's what I did not do talking about my my progress here is that uh, after, all, I'm just going to back up a minute here, after we moved out to BC and John Green got it started, I, I got working on Sasquatch, and then I dropped it because this going around the province asking people if they've seen any Sasquatches soon gets very embarrassing for one family. And they, and they really started to wish I wouldn't talk about that, and I started thinking, I really am making an ass of myself, I'm like, so, so I stopped, and I backed way up. And, and, when, and this is where I talk about, you know, like many things, there's no tracks. You know, well, we found tracks. We did, we did school tracks. This was a very significant event in 1988. I put aside Sasquatch for over a year and found tracks. And uh, the, the track we found, great track. Unfortunately, by the time we got back to make the plaster cat, the hiker, this was on a hiking trail, I, I can see that always, had stepped in it, motoring along, and so we got a boot print superimposed on the Sasquatch track. <laughs> Anyway, and I was, my own size 11 track, I finally stepped in the mud and made one of them too, just so I could have something for comparison. If it, I, uh, I did want to mention that. So, um, that's a, oh, and then uh, another thing I picked up from, from, from Grover's book, you know, we always, I, I was superficially thought, okay, a Sasquatch track is a scaled up human foot. And then Grover in his book, Grover Krantz, pointed out, actually the proportions are different. If you got a human foot as long as a Sasquatch track, it would only be about two-thirds the width. Well, again, that same shopping mall, the, the running shoe of Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> a basketball player with a size, uh, the discrepancy, 21 or 22 or anyway, turned up there, and sure enough, it was 15 inches long, pretty much the same length as my Sasquatch track. And I forget what the measurements are, but you can see that the width is, is, is something like this. It's not, a, not nearly as wide as this one. So the rule, the rule does hold for that one. And, and one does see some narrow Sasquatch tracks. I've been looking at some cast at John Green's house uh, yesterday and the day before. But by and large, that is true. There is this, and again, other people will cover this more thoroughly than I. There is this difference. So I always mention this to people, you know, because we're always talking about the whole thing and big humans. <laughs> Big humans probably wouldn't have as wide a track as Sasquatch if they even had that. Oh, and uh, this was another thing that happened to me back. It was uh, 1994. I mentioned this before. I got some publicity as a result of an interview that kind of got spread around a bit, and that was really quite a milestone for me. And that a lot of people started phoning in with reports, and they always kind of checked me out to see if I was a serious listener and if. They felt I was safe, so to speak. They'd tell me the story. So anyway, one fellow had some handprints in the snow. He'd seen, he has also, uh, this is not so far from us, Strathcona Park in behind Courtney. He, uh, he had footprints in the snow, which, as you know, don't photograph real well. And then there was a kind of a cliff face, and it was a scrambling situation. And uh, the Sasquatch going up there had put its hand down several times. And so it may not be very convincing, but it's interesting to me that we did pick up some, some handprints there at this time. Okay, now on to the, the whole thing, and this is there, I'm just getting into it, I'm really enjoying it, the whole thing about the, the native uh, knowledge and the traditions of Zunaqua, which is always shown with whistling lips, and it whistling or whooping, but anyway, and, and Bukwas, the other one, which seems to be Sasquatch. Uh, this actually, I have a better slide of this, but I have more of this one for now. It's from, from John Green's book. And this is the, the Zunaqua Totem in Victoria at the Longhouse there. And there is the mother with the whistling lips and her, and her child. And it was kind of a, an interesting thing. And uh, I got to uh, an abandoned Indian village on an 
island up, up uh, towards Knight Inlet this, this fall, I guess it was anyway, there was a totem lying on the ground there with this, this grizzly bear figure, which when you put it vertically, the grizzly bear with the teeth, on its paws are small Dunaqua Now, this is not quite in focus, is it? Small Dunaqua masks. I think there's one more. Yeah. Which is pretty interesting. And, and my native friend, who I went back there with later, said, yeah, it was a very important crest in this village, you know. And he tells stories about, about the people there when, when they didn't come. They actually called them Bokwas. When they, they'd smell of a boss when they're picking berries, so they'd stay out of that berry patch and go back the next day, and they just kind of lived alongside it, keeping sort of a respectful distance. But but this being not uncommon it, amongst the animals of, uh, of of that area. And talking more recently with Don Abbott, who uh, was an archaeologist in at the university, or sorry, at, at the museum in Victoria, he had worked with Mungo Martin, a carver who said that, oh yes, Bokwas is a real animal alongside wolves and bears and babies. So that's, that's kind of interesting. There are other native people who don't accept Zunaquas as a real animal, that it's a spirit. And some non-native had fun with the first lips of Zunaqua. This is at a museum near us here in May. Uh, they made this thing out available. It, 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 it's, they got it quite right. I don't know what the part is there. <laughs> And, and I also met this year Marjorie Halpin uh, at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC, and, and she had the paper on what she calls monkey masks. And, and to her credit, she refers to these in her paper as being ascribed to a zoologically unverified animal on the coast. And I thought, for an anthropologist, that's pretty good. I thought that's fine. So, and actually, I went to Ontario last summer, and I saw this mask. And, which is not as good as this is one I, I really would like to see. That. I find that quite interesting, quite different from the traditional stylistic uh, native, native artwork. But uh, kind of, and these are quite old, uh, 1927 and I'm sure 1914. And this is what was, and it, it's quite different from Zunaqua. The, the, the mouth is always quite different, e even teeth, and this, and often a hooked nose, and it, it's what. I, I use it because that's what they talk about so much. They don't talk so much when the people I meet about Tunica, but more about the bus. I thought I'd just put this in here, a map of Vancouver Island. Uh, you know where all for those of you who aren't around here, over here. And this is just kind of the midsection of the island. You come over to Nanaimo, you're about to start going up towards the north end of Vancouver. I'm right in here in Courtney. And uh, what's interesting to me is that with, with the publicity and the presentations and, and the friends, stories trickle in. And I'm now up to, it's about 46 sightings for the island. I know John Green brought me up today from his files about a year ago, about 16. And I'm just adding them, and I, th I can get a story so easily now. now. I have to be careful because I'm reminded of when I worked in Trinidad, I worked with a fellow there, and, and he kind of regaled me as we're walking through the forest about what this animal does and what that bird does and where you can find this. And he'd say, you like what I'm telling you? I, could, I have more, you know. <laughs> I, if he could produce stories on demand. I like to hear them, but I only wanted to hear the true ones. You know, I didn't want him to make them up. And I'm thinking, he wanted to please me so much. I'm thinking, gee, I, I don't know how to handle this. And I'm not, I hope I'm not like that thing, you know, tell me about give me a Sasquatch story. But no, these are things which come in, and, and very often, and I'll, I'll mention this later, I'm not, I don't I mention all, some of these people, and I mentioned last year, I think I'll get a call, and first thing, they'll check me, they'll ask a lot of questions, and they'll say, no, you don't use my name, right? Okay, no, we don't use your name. I know from this incredible story. And I had one like that, and it's it. I finally got to meet the guy last summer. We had breakfast together. And, and he had said, no, I don't want you to use my name because I work with this biologist and I don't want it to get back to him. I said, I understand that. So anyway, uh, and I, I had breakfast with him. I said, hey, I, had, I met that biologist in the and I said, hey, I did not mention you. He said, hey, it doesn't matter anymore. It's been 10 years. I, I know what I saw. And you could tell him, you could tell anyone. That was, a, that, that was pretty interesting that after time, people may change their mind. Anyway, what I wanted, the point I wanted to make, uh, my that I think is this one. Oh, lots of stories from the inlets, and I think um, the, the coast, I, th I think this is a very rich region. I think, you know how we, we make these maps for grizzly bears or any, or any wildlife species, and there's great habitat, good habitat, and poor habitat, or whatever. I think the coast is probably great Sasquatch habitat. You know, the whole thing about, but 
Bakwas, there, there's a native uh, depiction here, Bakwas in a bracket that's called cockle hunters. And there's a lot of sightings of, of, of Sasquatch on beaches in winter. That we always say digging clams, and they always say, especially cockles, and they like cockle beaches. I don't know. Maybe they know a lot more about the natural history of this animal than we do. But I think this kind of archipelago, great, you know, all that coastline, still very few people living there, very easy to overwinter. Okay, that's the boat going? Okay. Um, we could stop. We could have to change it sooner or later, aren't we? There should be a spare one underneath. Uh, I'll just crank this right there over here. Yeah, we, we, there'll be a check in the mail. Turn that off. Yeah, you got it. It'll be quite hot. Turn it on. I know there's other ones. Someone else speak? Who says he's a little bit of technical difficulty, so we're going to put Dr. John Bindernagel aside for the moment and bring up our next speaker. But you'll have an opportunity to complete this talk and this slide presentation. You'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, our next speaker, I met him last year in May of 95, and he told me about some physical... If you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, Please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.